they don't have a way of talking about the value of, of human life that doesn't become in the end to do with economic value. What is a person worth? Um, well, a person from my point of view is, is, is worth everything because they're a child, son or a daughter of God. We, in a sense, tune ourselves to that sense of the divine, the more that permeates our world through our meditation, through our evocation. I think worship can draw that out of human beings, especially corporate worship, when we are together, when we are attuned with each other. So the point of the church is not that it's there to do good, but that it is there to embody goodness by showing this is what it looks like to be a community of people who are trying to find out what good living is about. And that's what they're identified as trying to do. So I think for the sake of everybody, a flourishing church is a really important thing to have. How do we understand the term the second coming? It's not a New Testament term, the parousia, the making present of Christ. It's one of the most mysterious expressions in the New Testament, and I think it's very important to relocate it in the light of modern science. There will be an end of history, whenever it is, at the end of history, it will be the reality of Christ, which we fully recognize, all of us, to be the reality in which we have always existed. And that's the making present of Christ. That's, that's the second coming. It's not a literal thing. I mean, literalism is the death of spirituality. And if you take these sentences literally, that Jesus is going to come along in the clouds, he'll be all wet and damp, and he'll have lots of angels with him, and uh, be coming in at 25 miles an hour, you know, aquaplaning down to the Red Sea. Well, no, that just misses the spiritual point. It, it becomes a stupid story. I'm a devoted student of the Bible. I've studied it in Hebrew and Greek, and I find myself steeped in scripture from a very young age right the way through to now and I can't imagine ever being other than totally devoted to scripture. The scriptures I love, the scriptures that God has given us to be a means of exploration, questioning, challenge, have been domesticated. They've been reduced to mere certainties when actually our God is about opening up possibilities. The idea that the Word of God is infallible and we have to, to believe the Bible literally is a 16th century invention. It became common because of the disputes between Protestants and Catholics. I think it's Deuteronomy chapter 20 where it says if the cities of Canaan don't submit to be your slaves you should exterminate them all, men, women, children and animals. I cannot believe for a moment and I will never believe that God said that. Look at the history of the Soviet Union. That wasn't a kind of great paragon of moral virtue and freedom and peace and there was no religion involved in that. Look at South Africa. The churches transformed that situation and were at the heart of the liberation of people. Sometimes progressive liberal democracies have to remind the church of some of the basic principles of its own teachings of, of, of the master carpenter. Jesus has to be the touchstone for interpreting the Bible. If I follow the way of Jesus and in his day was able to confront the prejudices of his day, um, I can't support a church 2,000 years later which uh, reinforces prejudices against minorities. Well, there is a, a reference to selling your daughter to Midianites, I think, that illustrates for us that women are property. We've grown out of that. It's just not relevant. St Paul definitely thinks that men having sex with men is wrong for gendered reasons. And uh, these days we don't actually think it's something terribly bad to be a woman or to be feminine. And so, while there might be reasons for being cautious, the idea that they shouldn't do it because one of them becomes a woman, that's something that thankfully we've left well behind. Chastity is very different from abstinence and it's very different from virginity. It means moderation relevant to the state of life that one is in. If you see sin as fallibility and finitude, everybody lives with the regret for the things they could have done and in the end had to choose something else. 
not necessarily for selfish reasons, but because actually the problems of the world are bigger than any of us. And that can induce a tremendous sense of worthlessness. And the church's liturgy is about turning that worthlessness round and saying, in God, in Jesus, in Christ, you are forgiven that because God knows you are human. God knows you're human because he himself was human. That's what Christians have got to see and proclaim, really, that it's the mind of the universe which is expressed in the person of Jesus. Liberalism is trying to ensure that God the Holy Spirit is not restricted. And for me, liberalism therefore is liberating. Don't walk away from it because the church is too important. It's a vital part of God's economy of salvation. Whether it's to do with climate change or justice issues, we're going to continue to need good, thought through, liberal theology to support those campaigns that matter so much to us, to our children and our children's children.